money because I really need it to come. <laughs> I think we all do. Oh, come on in. Um, today we have a change in our program. We're going to have Don Kreveling. However, Mr. Kreveling is in the hospital with a very, very bad back, and he didn't have a history of back trouble. But we are so fortunate. I called this Mr. Hoyer, Jack Hoyer. And I called him and I said, when I opened our conversation, I said, now I want you to visualize me on bended knee. <laughs> I, I really feel it. I'm really asking a big favor of you. Um, Mr. Hoyer um, is an expert on, the, on tobacco and the history of tobacco. Uh, I've taken my, when I was teaching, I took my children to field trips to the experimental farm of the University of Maryland farm down on 202. Claude McKee, when he was there, and Claude said, you know, the man you ought to have doing this is Jack Hoyer. Who is this Jack Hoyer? So one time I took the class there, and he was there, and he spoke with the group, and I thought, I see what he means. So when we had the teacher's class this past year, we asked him to be one of our speakers, and he came with a slideshow that he's going to share with you today. And... Uh, they were just amazed. And he starts at the beginning of tobacco and goes all the way through. So even if you've grown it on a farm, I'm sure that there's some things here today that you will learn that will be new to you. So I'd like to introduce our speaker this evening, Jack, this afternoon, Jack Hoyer. Okay, thank you. I add, he's taught a three credit course on the culture of tobacco. And he said lot, most of his students were not tobacco growers, right? But I got a lot of tobacco growers here, don't I? Yeah, I don't know if you do or not. I I'm don't know. <laughs> if I get struggling here, I want one of you tobacco people to help me out. Uh, thank you, Jane. Mm -hmm. uh, she said I talk as long as I want, so mm -hmm. better figure at least an hour. <laughs> just get warm up. Uh, let me start with a little show and tell. Uh, this is half an ounce of seed, tobacco seed. And like the biblical mustard seed, you'll find it's very small. I'm going to pass it around. I counted these last night just before dinner, 175,000. 175,221. Uh, but I'm going to ask you some questions now, because you should be pretty good students and on the ball here. But when you look at this, look at the, not only the size of it, look at the color, Look at the seed coat. See if you think it's smooth around. Look at the shape. Is it square or cubical or, or what is it? So I'm going to ask you a little later to see how you do on this test. <laughs> and he will. <laughs> I've, I've seen him do it. <laughs> what happens if you fail the test? Well, we have some dishes. Uh, we can wash. <laughs> yeah, the weekend pass is gone. That's yeah. right. <laughs> Okay, I have a couple bones of tobacco, and I want to point out this is current tobacco. Uh, <coughs> not like to grow historical, and since your name is, is Historical Society, I'm going to talk about history. So historically, they didn't grow thin, bright-colored stuff like this. The market was for a smaller leaf, thick, tough, uh, stronger, uh, more of a brown color rather than a bright, uh, reddish, uh, cherry red color. So let me pass these around. Is that nope. That's Maryland. I said, is that barely that you mentioned? Barely tobacco. No, I'm not going to talk. I'm not going to say a word about Burley. <laughs> <laughs> Burley is another kind of tobacco that's grown in Kentucky and eight surrounding states. Uh, they're competitors of ours, so they're beneath me. <laughs> uh, Fred, if you can turn the juice on there and we get going. Uh, the light switch is right over there on the right. Yeah, I got a couple real dark slides. All four of them. I should point out that I'm a native of Prince George County. Uh, I'm a lot older than Fred, but I grew up with some of his brothers and sisters. Uh, brothers and a whole pot full of them up there. Uh, nobody ever did get a count on them. <laughs> My parents were members of this historical society. I, I don't know if they were charter members, but they were close. Uh, they passed away, uh, my mother, in 92. She was 94 years old. And I'm familiar with your newsletter, because when she got it in, I read it. She wants to know. 
Uh, let me start with the vertical. Tell you run out of Riverdale on the rail. I was run out of Riverdale 1941. I grew up in like, Riverdale when we moved to Bellstone 1941. Uh, as you all know, I'm sure, uh, I'm going to sock you with this history now. Uh, tobacco was founded by the Indians, and when the Spanish came around uh, this country and all the explorers that followed them, they found that the Indians were in Canada, U.S., uh, Central America, South America, wherever there were Indians, they were using tobacco. Uh, the name tobacco is supposed to come from this stick you see the fellow using here. It's a Y-shaped stick. He has a fire here, and he has the, the uh, uh, loads of that stick poked in his nose and hailing the back of that one. The name of this stick is Vago, or the Indian equivalent of Santa to these uh, crew of Thomas and Ship, that this was Vago, uh, is the way they pronounce it. Indian. They got a garble, but that name stuck the back. It was, it turned out later. Tobacco wasn't the stuff in there. Tobacco was the name of the tube. But at any rate, that's the way the name got started. Now for the Indians, uh, this is a familiar peace pipe thing that tobacco was used in three different ways. A peace pipe or ceremony use. Not only a peace pipe, but a sort of social gathering of big shots from one tribe to the other where they start off to establish a poor and use a peace pipe. Uh, the other thing it was used for was medicine. Isn't that a paradox? The way we pick up the <laughs> stigma against the back and now, but this they use it as medicine, and then it was used as a personal habit, just like we're using it now. Uh, the Spanish, uh, of course, when they came over, uh, they were looking for gold, treasure, and they got a little of it. They exploited the natives, ran there, got a few shiploads of gold, all the bag, but they soon ran out of that. And lo and behold. The tobacco the Indians grew turned out to be their gold, Spanish gold. Because they took this, learned how to grow it, the natives grew it for them. Uh, they hauled it back to Spain, processed it, the town of Seville. And those of you who are opera buffs, remember Bizet's Carmen, Carmen Singer, famous aria at Seville, the tobacco plant. The new operas, they call it cigarette. You don't believe it because there were no cigarettes around when you take it. So this became the manufacturing center of tobacco, and it was shipped all over, not only Europe, because the sailors from the Spanish ships spread this into China, uh, the Philippines, India, it went all, all around the Mediterranean, ran around the world. The uh, French, there's another paradox. The French, in the beginning, uh, you couldn't buy tobacco. You had to, you had to get it from a pocket carry shop. The medicine only the uh, doctor prescribed, and that's the only way you could get it. Uh, now these doctors had the same birds that uh, prescribed uh, leeches to heal broken bones and so on. Same bird. All right, let me move to London now. Tobacco is a big success, big success with the Spanish. And they're making a killing on it. Because not only are they getting it over here in our in the islands in this, uh, South America, Central America, they're hauling it. Spain on their ships, they're processing it, they're hauling it out to other countries and selling it. So they're making a big profit on this, and they're the most important nation in the world. Part of it has to do with the developments that followed along after the trade set up. Okay, let me jump to London. Here's a second, or uh, yeah, London. Uh, England is a second class country during this spell. We're talking in 1500. England is a second class country. They're nothing compared to Spain, and boy, are they envious of them. In London, if you went to buy a pound of tobacco, you'd find the top price is the Spanish tobacco. Top price $125 per pound. Average price $17.50 a pound. Right now, even with all the inflation that's going on, uh, the best price I've ever seen down in Marlboro or in Southern Maryland or Kentucky or Carolina. It's the best price I've ever seen in a dollar night. Here they are averaging. <laughs> well, you can see a feeding frenzy coming on here. It's like throwing out the meat into a school of sharks. Uh, it's really going to stir things up. 
Now, let's, uh, let me move to, uh, well, one of the things I want to point to, envy, England had for uh, fame, fame success. All right, let me uh, go on two of my heroes. Uh, this is Pocahontas. We're, we're getting into Jamestown. And this guy with no head is John Rawl. <laughs> There's another central character in there, but he's going as he, took, he got back on the boat and went back to London. That's John Smith. But there's some stories about him. Mm -hmm. uh, let me start with Pocahontas. When this ship landed Jamestown. These were a bunch of losers. There's no way in the world this thing is going to work. Because they're, uh, they're fed a bill of goods. The London companies, uh, the business interests, were trying to make money on this. England was favored because they wanted a colony in this country. Roanoke College bound, uh, uh, bombed out, they tried up Newfoundland, it didn't work, they were bombed with that. Right. So, <clears throat> they were awful anxious, but they got uh, this fancy advertising with the land of milk and honey, gold under every bush and so on. Uh, so that kind of people they got were poor characters. They were running away from something, had a bitchy wife, the, the sheriff was after them, there were all kinds of reasons they were on this trip and none of them had to do with making it successful. Oh. The Indians then were the, were the Powhatans, and they had a very powerful chief. This was a good tribe. A very powerful chief. He was, as like most leaders, he controlled a large group of people. Uh, he was ruthless. He was a very strong leader. That's where Pocahontas enters into the story. This uh, second. Uh, expedition is really going to be worse than Romo. These people are sick, they're out of food, uh, they're fighting each other. Uh, we got about the only thing we can do, I guess, is call in Dr. Kevorkian because they're, and they're fighting and kill an Indian. Now that's pure serious suicide. You kill an Indian when they got thousands of Indians over there and you got a bunch of sick guys there putting the way out of wet paper bag. So Kevorkian's the only man for them. Pocahontas, who was only about 14 now, and when they landed, she was 12. Uh, in my story, she was about 14. Uh, Pocahontas was the apple of the chief's eye, the daughter. She could do no wrong. She was a very compassionate person, so she prevailed upon her dad not to exterminate these guys. And even though one, uh, there was some killing among them, uh, one I mean, of food was short, and even going into the Indians and got to fight over a few years of corn and killed the Indians uh, for a few years of corn. Uh, sure, death, Pocahontas prevailed from dad to leave him alone. I, I've often felt, you know, based on recent news, that if we could get Lorena Bob and her damn knife and send her down there, Lord, that's her little bit. These guys wouldn't be fighting each other so much and fighting the Indians that could have been growing food and uh, trying to make a decent success of this time. Okay, our headless friend, John Rolfe, he's my real big hero. Because he was a research man, which is what I spent my whole life. <laughs> Lo and behold, he's a research man on tobacco. Big surprise. Uh, the Indians were growing a, a yellow leaf, I mean, yellow flower tobacco. That's good called them. Pushing out of tobacco, and this stuff is very strong. And uh, they tried shipping some of it, and nobody had anything to do with like smoking the ballroom rags from up here at the town hall restaurant in California. So he got some seeds from uh, one from uh, Trinidad and another one from uh, the Orinoco River region where it empties into the uh, uh, Caribbean, the uh, uh, Caracas. And he fiddled with those things and they learned how to grow them. And by the year 1613, he had enough of a crop that he could send it back to London and let them test it. It was only 300 pounds. He put it on the ship Elizabeth and she'd sail for London and landed. Uh, the merchants, because they were just as desperate for this colony to be success, or even more so than anybody. Uh, they tested this back and lo and behold, it was better than the Spanish, or so they said. <laughs> Good anyway, regardless of what. And tobacco from then on was a success. 1613, 300 pounds. 1617, four more years, 20,000 pounds. Five years more, 1622, it was up to 60,000 pounds. 
Well, you know the reason for that. That slide I show you. $17.50 a pound. They planted the streets down, the cemeteries. Uh, uh, kind of like Jamestown, there was no room left. And you couldn't have a garden or anything. It was in the back. Everything was in the back. Way up. Tobacco is dependent upon cheap labor. And the cheap labor in those days was family labor. And that's what you see here is family labor uh, crew harvesting the back. You see the wagon. Uh, it's a dump cart on a high axle or a big wheel so they can dump it. And, uh, you see mom's out. The kids are out. The old man is out. They've got the whole family there. And that's the cheap labor. Even true today. So all of these things of how they grew tobacco work out for John Ball. <coughs> Uh, one of the things to have a success is you have to have some way of getting this tobacco over, over to England because there's no market in the U.S. You know, no use even growing it because there's nobody here to sell it to. It has to go back. So the water becomes important. So the bay and its estuaries are very, very important. Here you see it more. The hogs of the back are being rolled uh, because of the way they move it since the forklifts. And the, right of the question, they, have, they roll it and lay down boards and want to raise it up and roll it up the board. Now, by the time Maryland came into the picture, uh, I think these people were realized that there wasn't land in Milton honey and there wasn't gold under every bush. So Maryland uh, was a much more considered operation when they came over for the operators for Maryland. Instead of the last year before Maryland in 1630, it was 1.5 million pounds of grown. Just in Virginia, all of it exported. Uh, this shows them loading uh, tobacco. This is the, the method of handling these uh, barrel-like deals, which are called hogsies. Uh, there are all kinds of sizes back then, they're pretty good standardized. Uh, but they were roughly 500 pounds a piece. Uh, this is on the edge, you, you can see this mass back here. So this is on the uh, water. So in addition to water, which I've mentioned, and cheap labor, uh, and a big, strong demand. All of these things in favor of tobacco. Uh, another place in the loading uh, back, put it on the ship. Uh, we, we had the inspection stations then. This is further along the period. We're talking uh, well into the 1600s now. Uh, this only in 1640, but both Maryland and Virginia producing the crop. Uh, the counties went up to 40 million pounds. Just two colonies. Uh, this is an inspection station where the uh, tobacco which came in, just only that price, that 1750, of course, you knew what happened to that. Down to the bob. Six to nine cents in a pretty good year. But they could still make money at six to nine cents. Uh, yeah, the inspection. Uh, when this price went down, it's a farmer's just natural reaction. They, uh, they immediately plant two plants where they hadn't one. The price went down because it was too much tobacco. So they plant twice as much and it goes down even further. And there's the, so the next step, and this happens with all commodities, not just tobacco, the next step is they start cheating. And they make a joke that over in France there's a cemetery with all the headstones in that cemetery from rocks that were stuck in the hogs, in the hogs and tobacco. So all of this cheating going on right in the back of the, the rotten apple, we were always in the bottom of the barrel. So, uh, and it took a long time, a lot of argument between Maryland and Virginia, because this had to be uh, coordinated. We finally got this thing in, and it did work. We inspected this tobacco, and we were able to guarantee it this uh, sample on the top represented the release. So at least the back inspection stations scattered around the Virginia and Maryland Tidewater. Let me talk uh, a little bit about growing it. Uh, one of the big problems when they first started out, both Virginia and Maryland, was the fact that this is all forested air for a tree. The tobacco cannot grow without sun. And, uh, anything that impedes sun is going to reduce your crop. <coughs> of course, they didn't have bulldozers, so what they had to do, incidentally, if you go up Mount Pierre Mansion and throw a monkey in a tree, 
That sucker could go swinging from tree to tree all the way to Akakeek or Apostco and never touch the ground. There's that many trees. So they needed something like a bulldozer to knock these things down. What they did was to go into a field and girdle the tree with an axe. There were no, there's no source of power at this point. No uh, oxen, no horses. Uh, it's all in your back. They had an axe, a hoe, and a mat. That's about it. As far as farms were concerned. They girdled the trees and just killed them. And then they planted their back in hills around the tree. There weren't in rows like we think of it. They uh, grew the back and eventually exhausted these fields. So uh, land was plentiful in about three to five years. Uh, the land was exhausted. The nutrients were used up in the back of the uh, third of the original size. So that since land was available, the, the system was to move to another farm. Of course, you had this labor of knocking the trees down again. And they didn't build barns this substantial. Of course, I can't come up with a picture of kind of barn. It was a very ramshackle thing. That their home was the same way. When they got ready to leave, they had the most valuable thing in that home. So like the the wood was plenty of that. With all the iron, the nails, the hinges, anything of that sort. They, they put a, a match to their house, and they put a match to the barn. And the ashes that dried off, they scrubbed around in there and came up with the nails and the bolts and the iron. Once land became expensive and they couldn't do, use this system, then they built barns like this. This is over in London County, it's some of you I'm sure have seen it, uh, in Hanlon County. Uh, this is a little over 200 years old. And you'll notice that to get in there, you have only one door in the middle. That means that the back has to be walked in and passed or through, either walking or passing from man to man, a bucket and gauge type thing, and then on up. You'll see the sides are uh, open between the logs so the air can move over there. The old rolling roads, of which you're familiar, and there are quite a few of them down in Virginia as well as up here. Uh, let me ask you a question here. This is not the big exam, that's the big exam. But what, is it, what do you see in common of these towns? Uh, uh, Fredericksburg, Petersburg, Richmond, Alexander, uh, Georgetown, Baltimore. Of all on water, but follow it up. It's, you've got to come a little closer. I'll give you. I'll give you a C on that. <laughs> they're all on the fall line. That's, oh, that's yeah. the point I'm trying. They're all on the fall line. These little towns mm -hmm. about there, because uh, as the back expanded west, and the limits of the expansion is could have to get to these uh, little towns, really little ports. So Bladenburg was a port, and you could get within range. You know, these. Uh, Rolling roads or hogs, that's a terrible way to treat the back because where that accident goes through, grinds it up and it's all tired. They're not worrying too much because they're selling the whole barrel to the buyer that uh, the buyer finds in there later on is not their concern. If it's ground up, I can tell you. The longer they haul it, the worse it is. So uh, the hogs that were used in this way as well, rolling by men. Uh, the ships were quite small, you couldn't handle many pounds of tobacco and many hogs, so they, you, uh, they had a lot of trouble loading these ships. Tremendous amount of tobacco fell in the water. They called it buck tobacco and it got salty taste because they drank it out of the water. <laughs> right that barrel out and sent it over to London. The heck with you. Uh, so the uh, main point I'm making here is, is the water. And you look down there in the addition to these towns, even preceding it is why tobacco was grown where it is because of transportation. Uh, but the list of rivers there, James, New York, the Rappahannock, Potomac, the Tuxic, Patsico, what, Manico, Choptank. So you can see all of these rivers and they're just a few hundred miles there. Uh, had a lot to do with the success of the tobacco. Okay, tobacco is a medium of exchange. Uh, of course, there was no monetary system, and uh, everything was bought and sold in terms of pounds of tobacco. This is St. Thomas, and true, most of the others. St. Thomas was a chapel of ease, the Mother Church of St. Paul, and down in the Bay. They taxed the members there at Bay uh, so many pounds uh, to build this chapel of ease. A minister made 16,000 pounds of tobacco a year. Uh, a 
wife was 125 pounds a year. That's that's to pay to, to get her over on the boat. That's the boat. Uh, ox is 90 pounds a year. Now there's an outrage. Uh, you could get a good ox for 90 pounds and he won 125 for a wife. <laughs> beer, uh, mug of beer, 8 pounds. Good solid meal, 12 pounds of tobacco. 10 pounds of tobacco. Uh, well, this brings me up to roughly uh, the, the birthday of Prince George County. Tobacco production was up uh, something like see, about uh, 60 million pounds at this point. Almost all of it from Maryland and Virginia. Uh, labor up to this point, almost all of it was family labor and indentured service. And uh, by family, I mean everybody. Mom, the kids, they're all out there. Uh, but toward the end of this period, then they started getting plantations coming into slavery. And this is a gradual thing, so you, uh, I have no right to draw a line on Prince George's birthday, but this is Prince George's Historical Society, so I figure I can get by with a full license there. Uh, so then the, the system of growing his tobacco switched over to the plantation system. These people, prior to that, had a miserable life. It's tough, hard scrabble sort of thing. Uh, how anybody ever put up with it, I don't know. I've been back on the boat, and of course it wasn't all that great in England. When the plantation system came in, then there was a different style of life. You had luxury, you had social skills. Uh, uh, <clears throat> and of course, with this cheap labor, I say you have to have the tobacco. We're still on the water or near the water, within range of water. We get this thing off so we can get to England with it. Uh, this is Belfield, down below Croom, John and Bowman's place. Uh, example of the many in, in this county, loaded with also. Uh, so the 1700s was more a period of uh, slave uh, produced tobacco, although there was still a lot of family labor, uh, very significant enough in the tobacco in this small family operation. Uh, one of the things I think about the plantation system in Mount Vernon, another example of it, uh, these were like small cities. The guy that ran them had to be a pretty sharp operator. He had to be a leader. He had to be able to manage and administer this. Uh, he had to work hard. And I think that it, my own theory, and there's a lot of other people have said the same thing, that many of these great leaders that we had in our country in the early days were a product of this foundation system where they were taught to manage and be leaders. And so George Washington believes the birds, the uh, Harrison's two presidents came out of that family. Uh, Jefferson. So I mean, you can list them forever. Uh, I think this plantation system has something to do with it. Uh, the Revolutionary War, the back of production, mostly through this, also including family labor, about a hundred million pounds. Let me back up. Uh, I want to make a sort of a, a wrap up or summary here. I'm going to switch to I'm getting my test ready. Uh, who was the biggest winner, do you think, out of all of this? Plantation owners? Certainly not that Howard Scrabble farmer who grubbed in the heat of white grass with the arrows into the sun. No, it was England. England, sure. England, the second past country when all this started. Now, tobacco is not the only reason, but tobacco is a factor in what I'm talking about here. Uh, England was a second class country. Uh, they didn't have much in the way of ships and so on. All right, this tobacco is shipped over there on English ships. We're completely at the mercy of the English. Uh, defense, shipping, everything. Uh, it's shipped over there on their ships. It's processed in England and in London. Uh, Generally, they don't miss an opportunity to make good Prince George County Democrats. They slap the tax on this back when they come into the court money. They process it and make products, most of which are used in the British Isles. A lot of it, though, is shipped over to Europe. Aha! Another tax. And it goes away from Europe and tax them again. That's two taxes already. Right? So this is not all the goody they get out of it. In addition to this, this tobacco uh, is not money for this tobacco not sent back to the colony, but sent back to manufactured goods from it. 
so that they get in on the manufacturing part too. So furniture, iron, many uh, tools, things like that. There's no way we can do over here uh, or ship back a little money. So they came out really well in this system. And, and following up on that, then the England developed this mercantile policy or colonial policy. That they're famous with from then on. This is the beginning of that. Uh, exploitive type things in various countries all over the world. One of the things that limited tobacco production at first, and that's going back to early Virginia and early Maryland, is there just wasn't enough boats in England to haul the stuff over. So they were feverishly building boats as fast as they could to get this tobacco back there and get this profit going. So they build up, in the course of this, a giant merchant marine where they have very little. Now, when you get out on the high seas in those days, you had the Spanish and the Dutch all out there, plus a lot of pirates, uh, some of whom were being paid by these uh, so-called uh, pure countries. Uh, you had to have a navy to protect this merchant fleet. The merchant marine the navy helped. So the navy expanded. And, uh, at the end of this period, England had the strongest navy and the biggest merchant marine. So no longer was England the second class fast country. Spain was the second class. Okay, let's go to our test. All right, these are the seeds through a microscope. And there are four things I want to point out uh, on the test. Uh, one, you all got that it was a small size seed. As small as mustard seed, you know. Okay, that's 25% you've got already. How about the shape? Did you all say it was round? Sure, it's sort of oblong. It's, uh, Something like a kidney bean seed, that type of How about color? It looks pure brown, a rich brown when you hold it up to light in a, in a bottle like that. But it's not, it's different gradations of brown, isn't it? It's sort of the pan, darker brown, medium, so there are a lot of different colors. How about the smooth coat? No way. Ridges and valleys? I hit four? Yeah. Okay. Well, I just have a sneaking hunch that you people only got 25% right. <laughs> but I think you bombed 75% of what I really think. So I'm going to prepare another test for you here. We're just going to see what you can do. I'm going to run through, this is what I call then and now. My daughter said I had too many slides in here, so she pulled my then and now slide out of there. Uh, how we grew it, uh, how they grew it then, and how we're growing it now. But I'm going to give you some uh, times of the year. Now remember, this fellow doesn't get a single plug nickel out of what he grows, nor did they in the old days, colonial days, until he sells his tobacco. So how long does it take with that investment, and money, and labor? Of course, in the old days there wasn't any money being invested with all labor. Uh, and in the old days, uh, it might be three or four years before they got into it. This is what put them in the buying in the plantations. If they had that. So let's start out in uh, October, uh, November. Let's say they October. Uh, he's gassing a bed. Uh, these plants, because of the small size of that seed, they can't hack it from nature. Uh, so weed seed is one of the worst enemies. Crabgrass will tear it up. Clover will eat up the body. So you just have to do something and Nowadays, farmers use a chemical. This is most methyl bromide, which is a very potent chemical. That's a sealed plastic there, so it doesn't get out. Now, that chemical is strong enough that it'll kill a Tyrannosaurus rex, which is easy to kill a rabbit. That's, and and uh, crabgrass seed has got no chance in the world. Perfect. Perfect. So he treats these beds. Now, what the old timers did back in colonial days is they went in the woods where there wouldn't be any weed seed because there'd been nothing but trees. They grew the trees again, uh, put the, and, the, and the soil is, is rich. It's full of organic matter from rock leaves and so on. Uh, this girdling of trees kills the leaves and then the sun can get down in here and then they plant that. Uh, now we're, we're in the March. First of March, He's using a little cedar. He's putting those little seeds out in this small cedar and do it. Now the old timer, uh, 
of course, is in the woods. He puts them out by mixing the seed with ashes from the wood fire, uh, real fine, blend in with that seed, and he takes a bucket and he goes over and he broadcasts it and he goes a couple of ways. It takes him a good while to do that. Uh, but he seen it instead of around the 1st of March, he did it right after Christmas when they were given the land. <coughs> One of the things about a tobacco plant is it makes a tremendous amount of seed. As a matter of fact, about 300 to 350,000 seed uh, fall from plant on the one plant onto the ground. Now, I didn't count then, so you have to take a word with that number. So you would think, well, that Southern Maryland would be covered with wild tobacco. But that seed is so weak and so small that it can't hack it in nature, so you'll never see a volunteer tobacco. You just you can't do it. Uh, to compensate for that you know, vulnerability of the plant, they cover it with the cotton. This is a new farm. That, that's just muslin and cloth. So the old timer uh, put leaves or straw over the tobacco, and then he laid limbs on top of that. And then it started to warm up in March. He took the limbs off still had this coat of leaves there, and uh, as it got warmer, he'd rake these leaves uh, so he'd move maybe 10, 20 percent at a time. Uh, so that the sun, when the plants did finally germinate, then the sun would hit them. It does not need light to germinate. Uh, again, because of the tenderness of this plant, we are able to irrigate. In the old days, they couldn't. The only conversation they had was by being in the woods location with a lot of rotten organic matter. This would hold moisture so they would not dry out near as fast as this condition in the field. But for us, you have to irrigate it to get these little seeds going. Well, once temperature reaches over 50 degrees, uh, uh, this seed in about uh, a week to 10 days will germinate. In a lab, we'll do it in four days where we keep it constant at the temperature. But if you're out in the open and the nights are cool and so on, we call for maybe two weeks. So this little root that has come out, and you can just look at it in this slide and see that that thing is very tender and uh, it's going to need plenty of help to make it. Uh, one of the problems with them is diseases, insects. We spray uh, the fungicide and the uh, insecticide to mix these put them on. But back in the woods, uh, the only uh, way they could combat diseases would actually to rotate. So they have a bed in this part of the woods have a disease problem build up, then they remove their bed site. That means girdling more trees, so it's not a late decision. Girdling more trees and making space uh, put in the bed there, and that way they could reduce disease of sun. Okay, we're uh, we're at June now. This is somewhere around June 1st. It would take a few weeks. Uh, this is what I call the uniform perfect bed. bed. These are uh, ready to go. Now, you're not going to find even our current farmers, you're not going to find many of them have a uniform looking bed like that. Uh, and if you were to go back in colonial days and look at those woods beds, they wouldn't be even near as good as before. There'd be uh, maybe 50% of the plants have been missing. So they made twice as many beds as they needed in order to get enough. Okay, now here's where the labor really starts. Because I'm also going to give you some figures on labor. <laughs> Pulling these plants out of the bed, drawing plants. Uh, this takes 10 man hours an acre. One man will work 10 hours to get enough plants to clean an acre. 10 man hours. Uh, they pull those plants, a dirty, nasty job. It's hard on your back. You bend over all the time. They don't, even when you put a board out there, they don't use it because you have to move around so much. So you can just stoop over. Uh, very slow work, very monotonous. Uh, the method in the colonial days is exactly the same. In other words, we haven't improved that. Uh, while these beds are growing, then they prepare the land for the crop. Now, with tractors and plows and so on, we can have a covered crop like this, small rain and plowed under, and uh, uh, you can see almost no uh, remains of green. So there's no problem at all. But in colonial days, uh, in the beginning, of course, they didn't even have plows. They had no animals to pull the plow. So they, they just used the mattock and filled up the thing. And there's no way in the world we could put anything like this there, because even when they had oxen and horses, they couldn't handle this big growth. Fertilizers also put out here. And in the old days, uh, they didn't have fertilizer. And they started using the same fields over and over again and cut out the jumping farm. Uh, they started using manure if they had enough animals to give them manure. Old tobacco trash went out there, so they had uh, 
uh, oyster shell was used for limestone, <coughs> uh, which was useless really as far as uh, doing the job. Those are going on before planting. All right, here's the planting operation today. We planted in rows rather than hilling up. It's flat. Uh, I, I meant to point out when I was on that uh, uh, slide way back here the, uh, how they grow in the back of Virginia. Those plants were checked. That is, they were rows both, both in both uh, direction. Uh, here you see that they're just single rows and that one is moved. Now this is called an automatic transplant. Now one, two, three, four, five, automatic. Back in the beds <laughs> to keep this crew in the field, there's got to be five more people. So this operation, two rows at a time, is ten men or ten people. Don't have to be men. In fact, women and, and kids are better at this than, than the old man. His hands are too clumsy uh, to do this quickly. That's that's not automatic. Now back in then. Of course, they didn't have the machine, and they did it at the same rate of speed these people are doing. The only difference is these guys got an easy job. They can have a radio on there. This guy can have a uh, him over top of him. Uh, it's a lot easier to work at this system, but the speed isn't any more. What they did before is they waited for a rain, so-called season. They got the soil saturated. Uh, they pulled their plants, and the whole family went out there. The first kid dropped the plant on the road and went across the road. And they're checking these plants so the rows are prescribed and cross-prescribed. Uh, somebody went before and picked the plant up, poked the hole in the ground, and, and dragged his foot on it and covered it. So they went across the field in twos like that. And they planted just as fast as this plant did. But boy, that was hard work. Uh, and this, this is in June now. I remember the humidity uh, right after rain, the humidity is high here. Temperatures in June can be very high. It's tough on those people. All right. right after planting this, this is two hours after planting, this plant flops and if you look at it and say there's no way in the world that's going to live. Uh, these were planted about two, this was just planted about an hour before I took the picture, so you can see that great age there. These rows are a flop more. Mm -hmm. So it looks like it's not going to make it, but uh, they will make it. Better than 95% of those plants will make it. But back then, the way they were planted, 75% uh, was a pretty good figure. They lost a lot of plants. When we lose a plant, we can go back and replant. Then they went back in there and missing plants, 25% they replanted. So I mean, when it grew off, you had plants of different age. Uh, now, I, I, I don't know, I made a Point. I want to make a point now on this tobacco is a medium of exchange back in formula phase. It was a very imperfect barter system, very imperfect. And here's why. So we have availability of irrigation. So this uh, this uh, tobacco is about a month old, a little over a month old. Uh, you can see them irrigating it, getting it going. Uh, this is uh, what they call lay by that they go through with a tractor and a cultivator. You throw this soil up to the roots and uh, kill weed seed. In the old days, they didn't have that system. Uh, later on in the old days, when the days where they had horses, they could go through there with the horses, sweep it up and do almost, well, probably a better job in this tractor thing because he, he's walking behind him and he has the control of that public to move it around. So he'd do a better job than the tractor. All right, back to irrigation. Here you see a farm field. <coughs> The thing this does is give you consistent tobacco from year to year. And you've always got good tobacco. In the old days, where they didn't have any kind of irrigation system, it was tobacco in the dry season, and we had two out of every five years of the dry season. You get old, tough, leathery, small tobacco. Uh, you have trouble smoking it, and it's strong, knock the back of your head all up and you smoke it. Uh, so, the preacher made 16,000 pounds of tobacco a year. Well, you can see what happened here in this imperfect system. Uh, let's say you uh, you made that from the whole parrot. So from uh, let's say your uh, bill was 500 pounds. You had a real good crop. The price was good. And you didn't pay in that year. And you said, "Well, wait a minute. Uh, I'm short here, preacher. I'll, I'll catch you next year." So you sell that. Next year you got a dry, tough crop. So then you're paying the 500 pound bill. 
you cannot write. And the, and the ministers were rightfully so very bitter about it. And this led to some lawsuits and some Patrick Henry's things. And, uh, oh, he put me in that house of burden. Okay, Maxie, you recognize these people? Been a year or so ago. a year or so ago. This was a very dry year. This is an experimental farm. Uh, here's a pot of tobacco that was not irrigated. Uh, you see the tobacco is uh, a little over knee high. Now let's move 20 foot in that direction where we irrigated. There, see, it's way over chest height. Uh, only difference 20 foot in the we watered there and not together. So you can see the effect on the quality of the back. Now that's a little tight. Uh, Mark is good. She's steaming out of there, so he's obviously scared of something. But it's got to be a snake, maybe a, a python or a cobra or something. <laughs> but it turns out it was a hornworm. <laughs> and these hornworms were around in the colonial days, too. They came over on the Susan B. Constant, I think. Uh, these things get about five foot up high. <laughs> I, I, I admit to exaggerating a little when I talk about that. Not that much. Uh, five inches in length when they're full grown, and this one is full grown. Uh, they call them a hornworm, and uh, uh, they didn't know the difference, but this horn is on the tail, and the head is up here. Uh, I call this a dollar eighty cent worm because he'll eat about a pound of tobacco in his throat, and uh, a pound of tobacco is worth about a dollar eighty cents. Uh, this is the kind of damage one worm will do. Now, in the old days, uh, they walked through the fields. Uh, the women and kids were a little squeamish. We'd carry a bucket, and they'd pick these things off and throw them in the bucket. And they'd walk right down the road. Each kid would have a row. And they, uh, usually the old man who didn't worry about being squeamish would just grab and squeeze their heads off and throw them down. So, uh, later on, uh, uh, we got to where they could put geese or turkey in there. Now, I'm, I'm talking they, they, they had the Civil War. Uh, you can rent turkeys out to the tobacco farm. Rent a turkey, what they call it. They go down there and they get these, these worms. Uh, some people saw that what the turkeys were eating and said they weren't going to eat any more turkey. <laughs> uh, one other thing I would say, that they were picking these worms off. If those worms are as big as this, this picture I'm showing, these things are finished. They're full. This this worm will die tomorrow. So it's no use picking him off then. You've got to get one of these less than an inch of size. Then you're doing something. He's already eaten his pound of tobacco. He's out of here. Okay, now we're in August. This crop has been on the ground about two months. Uh, tobacco is what, we, uh, what the botanists call a determinant type growth plant. What that means is that in the early part, it makes all of its puts all of its energies into uh, producing the foliage, the stalk, the stem, the leaves. Uh, this is very determined, and then there's a change in uh, uh, growth regulators, the chemical growth regulators in there, and all of a sudden it stops this and it goes into the reproductive cycle. In the first stage of which is making the seed. I mean, the, the flower which will make the seed. Uh, well, there's no way the farmer can sell this leaf. In the, John Roth, among his discoveries with this plant, his ingenious research, and uh, we broke that top out of there. Uh, it was energy that would have gone into the reproductive cycle, going into the leaf. So they go through this process called topping. Uh, topping takes about six man hours an acre, and just grab that thing and break it out. Uh, it was pretty fast. It's not really hard work, but it's hard on your hands. You get blisters. You start off breaking it here, and then that get a blister, and then you break it there, and finally you run out of fingers. But the, you haven't run out of back yet. Mm -hmm. So you get sore hands when you're done with this. There's another picture you might recognize. Uh, these kids, this is over in Eastern Shore on the Nanticoke River. Uh, they're topping this uh, right there. Uh, the way I put it in, as you see, he's uh, got dirt in his hands, and rough horse in his hands with dirt. This tobacco has a tar, a tar or a, a gum on the top, and it's particularly concentrated on the top of it. So when you go through topping, by the time you've done one row, your hand is black with this gum. The gum builds up on top of gum and pretty soon you can scrape it off. Mm -hmm. So often they get to the end of the row, they scoop up a hand and pull a sword and, and rub the hands and it takes them off. Uh, 
right now the most uh, time consuming or not the most time consuming that's a mistake the hardest the most strenuous work is the uh, hardest the same way now as he did when the phone was there he was a knight much like a Tommy Hawk and when he came in you saw one of them hanging on the wall there whack that thing down and let it whip uh, after it's well they'll pick it up in the spirit in the field now this picture doesn't show you see a stick here and there was a stick hanging on the wall there was a spear on it sharp cone-shaped spear you put on top of this stick and uh, run the plants on it splits the stalk and run it on it put five or six plants and in colonial days they used the same system the sticks weren't sawn they were rive sticks or they were round sticks the way they grew in the woods uh, they didn't uh, spear it in the field though like this right, he gets a stick with the back he throws it in a pile so you find out a row of piles coming through the deal. Now we've got trucks, tractors, and so on to help us move. So this is the only advantage we have over the old time. <coughs> now, the old timers, it was a family farm. And the kids, they had little kids, they couldn't pick a stick to the back of uh, What they did with those carts, you remember I pointed out a high wheel cart. It'd be like a trailer. Dump. They went through the field, and the little kid could pick up one plant, he'd pick it up, and they'd it. Bigger tea could pick up two or three or whatever and they'd throw that on the cart. Until uh, the cart was full, they ran it to the barn, and usually mom was there. And, and, uh, dad would probably be moving back and forth. Uh, there they're in the shade of the barn. Those barns are hot. There's no relief in there. There's no air moving. At least there's some air moving. They spear it there in the front of the barn. Uh, currently, it's run on to a truck. Here you see in a bucket brigade that he passed to him and passed it to a guy who's not quite in the picture there. There he is up there and he's piling on the truck or uh, wagon or whatever and there's a load heading through the barn. Uh, there's another picture you might recognize, Maxine, in your Sunday school play. Uh, I got my daughter to see how many of these plants she can, uh, this had six plants on it, which weighed about 30 pounds. So I gave it to her and said, pick it up. She couldn't make it, so I pulled a plant off and I pulled another one, so I ended up with three on there and she could pick it up. But it's a job. Uh, these are the barns. These are the uh, now barns. Uh, this barn is 100 foot by 32 as this. Is, uh, this is 60 by uh, 48. Uh, this one's 48 this way. Three acres, three acres, two acres, one acre capacity. The old barns would handle uh, about an acre, an acre and a half. Uh, they didn't have uh, uh, those barns, I didn't point that out. Uh, you see doors in the end, so you can take a truck or a wagon and go right under where the tobacco goes and pass straight up. In the old days, they had a uh, pointed out when we went through it, you had to pass the tobacco or walk it uh, into the barn, so it might take three persons to get to where it was going up and then move it up. Besides the barns open, uh, this, this is air curing in the old barns. You remember the logs, the, they didn't shake the logs so air can move through it. Worked excellently. Uh, these barns nowadays, 25-30% of the size open up so you can get this air flow through them. This, this is a picture I knew <laughs> in the dark room. It works. What I was trying to show you here is mm. moving the tobacco up in the barn. This tobacco is on both sides of them so I couldn't get much light. But there's a man standing uh, here and he's reached down and grabbed it and there's a man over top to show that the picture goes up in there. No air movement, uh, 30 pounds, 25 pounds at a time going up. And it goes up a lot harder than it goes down. Man hours involved in these things. Cutting, 8 hours. Experience, 16 hours. Hanging in the barn, 16 hours. Picking it up, putting it on the wagon, 8 hours. Moving it to the barn from a very good point. Okay, one of the things, uh, I mentioned the tobacco to be successful, I, I talked about the uh, demand and the good soil, the climate is something I didn't emphasize. But one of the things that makes Maryland tobacco unique and why it was a success and the same thing would be true in the of Virginia is the fact that we have high humidity, so the curing rate is slow. Early in the mornings is a common scene down in the uh, upper marble on down. You don't see it as much in the power of Need slow curing of tobacco. More chemical transformation, you get a, a different product. And say this is Maryland, it's unique in the 
rice in the man over here. I just try to show the color change. When it goes into barns, uh, this is a little dark, but it's just poison green. This is 85 to 90 percent of water. No wonder it's typically 30 pounds. Uh, a week later, uh, if it's a good ripe tobacco, it's turning completely yellow. These are when you want this, uh, when that fog in, you want this process to be slow. From here on in, you're going to dry it and you want it to go fast. So it goes from the yellow to the red, it's dried out. However, you see the mid rib and the veins and the, well, the stalk didn't show up in this picture, but it's also green. And at the end of six weeks, it's completely cured. The stems, everything is dried up. And cured. The only thing that's green is the stalk, and that won't die until we have a real hard killing frost, and that will be green. Okay, it goes uh, all winter long. Uh, this curing is usually, uh, we'd like to see it finish the uh, harvesting done by the first, uh, or by the 15th of September, uh, with many farmers in uh, October. But that's a risky process. After it's cured, it goes into a uh, stripping process where they pull these leaves off and put them in with various grades. Tied into bundles like this, so that, that's one great at the back. In March, uh, it's a, on the top of this load, you'll see shallow baskets, and there was one hanging on the wall that came in. We don't use hogs until now in the farm level. Uh, the farmer is putting it, uh, in the old days, he's putting it into the hogs. Here it's going on with these shallow baskets, and that'd be about 200 pounds per basket. Close to it. This is over to Wason's Corner trucks waiting to get unloaded, going to the auction system rather than the consignment system like we did in the front of the uh, This is at Evans, which is a shell station now. Uh, this sale is going that way. These are all buyers. Uh, this is the auctioneer right here. This is the guy starting the sale. He's calling out a price. Uh, this is a, a guy who actually paid by the auctioneer, by the warehouse, but he's, he's bidding against these guys trying to force them up because he gets it. The warehouse gets the percent. All right, they really move along here. This down there's a pecking order to these guys. This guy's first. He's buying for Switzerland, and he was paying top dollar, and he was buying the most pounds. And he's top dog in his pecking order, so he goes first. This guy down here is not buying much at all. He's walking along, getting tired. He's not doing it. He's getting all the dust from these other guys. Uh, do they move 300 miles an hour? 300 miles an hour. Walked the wrong step. Uh, the hogshead isn't dead. This is down in Virginia, down Bando. Uh, this is the back of bought for, uh, I, I, don't, I think, West Germany. Uh, and this is a recent picture. Uh, if they do put it in the hogs, it's there. It's, it's the guy who bought it. Anyway, he puts it in the hogs. Uh, there are some uh, dealers who use boxes, depending on what the customer wants. Uh, they don't age it uh, over in the country because they have to pay. Insurance, they have to pay tax, uh, they have to, uh, other, uh, other than the transportation. So it's money ahead if they'll store it in this country because it's ready to use, and then put it on the boat to pay their tax. <laughs> they all do. Uh, big percent of it is hauled on up the ball when they call it. This is a, uh, a load of the Maryland tobacco up in ball. Uh, this ship is going to Holland. The tobacco has been bought by Belgium and Luxembourg, a company that concentrates in Belgium and Luxembourg. Uh, so they will land in Holland and they'll be trucked into uh, Belgium. Okay, that's all the slides. Uh, let, me, let me go back to my test. <laughs> okay, how long did it take us now? We got some money there and we sold this thing, I should point out, within 30 minutes when that auction line went down and the, this grower has his check. But how long did it take him to use his labor and he borrows money to buy fertilizer and machinery and so on? Yeah. Yeah, no, no, you're not right. Yeah, right. year and a half. There you are. It's, it's uh, 17 to 18 months because we started in October or November. There's a variable there. Uh, we went around. We, were, we, we finished harvesting. I mean, finished curing in October. So a year's gone by then. Uh, so we still have to strip, uh, we still have to sell, and so we're talking March or early April. So it's 17 to 18 uh, months of going by before he gets his first nickname. Okay, how about man hours? 
we'll talk about all this later. Uh, we do it a lot. You, know, you added up those figures as I was going along. I'm uh, sorry. We do it quicker now, but not a whole lot quicker. Uh, about 250 man hours. Much of it real hard work. Strenuous work. Uh, this is per acre. Yeah, all of these figures, I'm talking hours and so on, are per acre. Uh, so, uh, well, the colonial, I don't have a figure for them, but it would have been 300 to 350 because the machinery and tractors and so on do help us some. Mostly, though, they make it easier for us to work. So uh, I think that's what I wanted to cover. So if you had questions or you wanted to argue something, uh, I'm ready for you. <laughs> why, why did they call it the Holland's case? Oh, okay. I, I think, because I get that question a lot. In, in the old days, uh, old England, uh, the wine was served in the hogshead. It was rather originally was a hogshead, but it was shaped like a hogshead. This wine was in there poured out of the side, so it was a form of storage, uh, transporting wine. And so they, I think, next to wine was put in barrels. So I, I assume, and all this I'm pulling out of my imagination, I assume that then they called the barrel hogsheads, even though they didn't resemble a hogshead at all. And uh, then everything was shipped in barrels because. Without forklift, how else can you move weight? These tobacco hoses are 500 pounds. So there's no way you can lift that. Grain was put in barrels. So I think, let's see that. One of you, yes. I don't want to be a devil's advocate. Okay. But I almost didn't make it to this meeting because of tobacco. <laughs> I have bad back that I've had for three months because I have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Why do I have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease? <laughs> because I smoke tobacco <laughs> from the time I was 18 till I was middle aged. Well, uh, and I don't wish it on anybody. I don't want to talk about back bones, but uh, <laughs> uh, I was, uh, I don't know, 12 years ago old or something like that. There's still kids like me were all uh, going out and smoking other people's butt. OPBs, they go to other people's butts and pick a couple of experimenting type thing. But I was going to be a big league baseball player. I watched the Senators basically and since I was going to be an athlete, well, I, uh, I did smoke. There was a, I had an incentive there. So uh, I, might, I might get lung disease too. I don't know. It won't come from smoking. Uh, yeah, this is a terrible thing. I don't advocate tobacco or smoking. I'm 100% uh, against it. Always have been. Don't you have any other uses for it other than kind of cheese? Yeah. Recreation or so called? Uh, there was a time when, uh, you know, this Black Leaf 40 you used on roses. Mm -hmm. That was nicotine sulfate. They got this originally, uh, it was from mm -hmm. tobacco products. It was a, a byproducts from the processing plant. Mm -hmm. uh, the big factory, the sweet, the sweet and the salt, the floor, and they took it and processed it and made black leaf 40, so 40, which was a nicotine salt. During the war, it was difficult to get this, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture actually had research where they were growing plants which were higher in nicotine mm -hmm. in order to be a source for uh, insecticide. Uh, they fooled with this, I mentioned uh, the tobacco and rust, and they pushed it on a rust, they made it back here to the Indian group. That stuff's about twice as high in nicotine as the commercial tobacco. Really. So they experiment with that as a source of nicotine. Really. The only other thing is an experiment which hasn't worked and is not going to work, but there's been a lot of publicity about it, is you can take tobacco and make a protein out of it, which is very edible. Just chemically treat this, uh, process it, pull out a, a pure uh, protein. It could be mixed with some food that has a viscous taste of it. Mix it with some food that has a taste or flavor or aroma or something. Uh, it makes a good uh, theory, but they've never been able to, uh, to get it to the food stage. Yeah, and they're still playing with it a little bit. The effort they're putting into this is really not really good. Really. It's not a super temperature. There's a plant. The Edelman the Edelin brothers are closed now, is that right? right? Yeah, they had a... They had a warehouse down in the You plate. used to be able to go and watch mm -hmm. the marsh. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that there's less tobacco being produced? 
there has been a drop in, in Maryland tobacco. It's sort of leveled off. There's also been a drop in the number of growers. Because uh, there's a big competition here because of dormant work, construction work, and they have options. Uh, one year, uh, 1988, I believe it was, or 89, we had a big price for tobacco, about $1.80. A lot of these young fellows would go uptown and work quit their jobs and came back and said, I can make money, more money growing the back at that figure. Of course, the next year, uh, we had a bad crop and the price went way down and these people went back up to the house. Uh, Where do they have to take their tobacco? Well, there's, there's still two in Marlboro. Oh, there Farmer's are. Warehouse, mm -hmm. which is uh, uh, right next to the Evans. It's one that's not on Fair One, going toward Marlboro. And there's Marlboro Warehouse, which is another quarter of a mile toward Marlboro. And there's that one I showed on the slide, which is the Wason's Corner. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one big one in Waldorf, and there are two in Houston. Mm -hmm. None in the plate in that. There's a big push to uh, uh, make addicts of marijuana for Europeans. Everybody, uh, I'm told by people from Europe that everybody well, smokes. Well, I don't think there's anything different. In Europe, this has always been going on here. They smoke and always have smoked on here. <coughs> they, they started smoking when it was a medicine. It was good for you. Uh -huh. But was it a medicine? Well, this is... So. I don't know. How much time... I, I like... Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I've been here long enough. But, uh, I've got some uh, old literature there. One is praising uh, how good this stuff is uh, for your health. And another one, which you all read, I'm sure King James first encounter blast in the back of where he tears it up. I, I like to, where I have time, uh, read these two competitive things. But, but uh, King James was running down the back. He was 1600 when he put out this counter blast in the back. Uh, this is uh, where the doctors were recommending it in France and Holland also. I think you could only buy it in an apothecary. That was back in the 1500s. Did 1500. What was it supposed to do for you? Oh my gosh. <laughs> everything. Yeah, everything. Oh. I mean, this is going to really break you up to read this thing. It cleared superfluous phlegm, I remember. <laughs> uh, this guy, this was a, this fellow named Harry O, who was one of the early explorers. He was before the Roanoke Collie, or I guess he came in around the time of the Roanoke Collie. Uh, you didn't get hives. Didn't have sore feet. These Indians, he looked at it, they didn't have sore feet just because they're smoking in the back. <laughs> yeah. Tobacco in the colonial time was a medium of exchange, and yet I don't recall hearing any great robberies of tobacco uh, barns or, or uh, tobacco merchants. Well, of course, at the barn stage, you're going to make a whole lot of work, and nobody wants to steal it when it's hanging there because the man hours are yet to come. Uh, I don't know what I mentioned, uh, but stripping the back and bear, uh, I think I forgot to throw a figure out. That's 100 man out. <coughs> Most times it's in the book. So nobody in his right mind is going to steal that. Now, if you get it into a basket uh, ready to sell, now it's stealing, but it's pretty rough to, because uh, you're talking 200 pounds. It takes, because the basket is, where the back has so much volume and bulk, it takes two men to pick it up. And, uh, this the ceiling does go on or, or did go on quite a bit and uh, I, I remember a story of you know of judge bowen down he's retired now but down in uh, calvary county he said he says well you can steal a man's wife that's all right in calvary county but you touch his back and you got to speak for me <laughs> <laughs> this was an actual case they throw him in jail for two years for stealing a pile of tobacco which is probably worth uh, 150 dollars i'd like to ask uh, I know down in North Carolina they they uh, food cure tobacco. What's the difference? Uh, this time I worked for Clemson University before I came around for four years, so I've been through that for four years. All of this tobacco that I've talked to, the period I've talked to, it was all going into other than cigarettes. There were no cigarettes. Then. Cigarettes were not a significant factor mm -hmm. until uh, 1913. So Friday I was chewing it was snuff with the pipe. Uh, working men couldn't fool with a pipe because they had out of the hands of carpenter. You could be fooled with a pipe if you knew. It takes three hands to smoke a pipe when you're working. So uh, they all went to snuff.
opportunity. Yeah, it's, uh, the flu cured tobacco then uh, was discovered by accident where they did, they put heat in that, remember that stick of yellow tobacco? Mm -hmm. Right, if you were a flu cured farmer, you had it like that, you slapped the heat to it, you dry it out overnight, and you would fix this yellow color. You would also fix sugar. Because the sugar's contents that, uh, that at the yellow stage is going to be about 10%. But if you let it natural air cure, the sugars will break down uh, into other products, and uh, the Maryland tobacco will have less than 1% sugar. Uh, so they discovered this blend in uh, 1913. Reynolds tobacco, uh, Josh Reynolds came up with this thing. And he blended flu cured and burley, which is conducting, as we mentioned already, a little bit of Maryland, and then he imported tobacco from. Uh, Greece, uh, Turkey, Turkish tobacco, it's called. Now, very aromatic stuff. Little tiny leaf, I think you drink. Very aromatic. Put all of these into one blend and wrap it in paper. And uh, the, the, the sweetness from the, the public took to it right away. So, uh, those people in Southern Virginia, both Carolinas, Georgia, and Florida, started growing this. And as the market for cigarettes went up, their uh, sales went up. And what they're doing with these so-called flu cure, because originally they had flus, they were just cheap tin pipes that had bigger end ran over the floor and then up a chimney. And they'd stick up there pretty high to get a draft. Then they just raised the temperature, which dropped the humidity and dried it overnight. So that's flu cure in a nutshell. Burley's uh, flu cure makes up about 40% of the cigarette. Burley makes up two and a half. Early, about thirty percent. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Very good. I have to plug the tricentennial while you're all here, you know, and I hope that you'll all be enjoying and joining in with the tricentennial efforts in your churches and your communities in many, many ways. And we'd like to present you with this. Um, this is the tricentennial t-shirt. They won't think that's my age, will they? No! <laughs> and this was the original design, which had tobacco leaves on it. However, due to the people's concern about tobacco and health, uh, this is no longer um, being produced. So you have a collector's item. I could just call that some other tobacco. Well, of course. Mm -hmm. It's a trumpet vine. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, those of you who came in late didn't know that Mr. Krebling, who had originally been planned for today, uh, became very ill with a back problem. And we asked Mr. Hoyer to do this on very short notice, and he graciously did it. We're very appreciative of it. Thank you. Yeah. It was a real struggle to put up with such a motley crew. Yeah. <laughs> um, at least you weren't mutants. Yeah. Not tangled with them before. <laughs> We, uh, let's see, Maxie, you had a, we have an announcement here on, I think it's the 25th of March. There's um, a book and author talk luncheon. and luncheon. Um, if you're interested in it, the authors are Ronald Kessler and Doris Mortman. And uh, she's been reading some of their books, so you might want to talk to her about that. And that is going to be, it's sponsored by the library. It's to benefit. Yes. Benefit the library system. Which library? All the Prince George's County Library. Library Foundation. Mm -hmm. And it's a women's club. Yes. So if you might be interested in it. Here's, here's one. If you need more, I'm sure it can help you out. And uh, the refreshments are going to be upstairs today. Now, you can walk. Dusty, how do you want us to do this? You can go out this way. Go out that way and up the deck, or you can go around. Or you can go all the way around and not have any steps. So uh, you can go around, or you can go up on the deck and go in that way. Is the is the um, store open today? Gift shop? Yeah. Is the gift shop open today? I'm, I'm not sure. I'm sure it's some point it won't